The events discussed in this video took place in the Canadian city of Laval. On October 2, 2009, 37-year-old Natasha Kournoyer did not come to see her mother. She did not answer phone calls, and she was not at home. It soon turned out that none of Natasha's friends and work colleagues saw her that day. At about 5 p.m., her relatives filed a missing persons report, and the police began their investigation. Natasha worked as a public relations specialist for the Correctional Service of Canada. First of all, the detectives decided to go to her place of work and interview her colleagues. Arriving there, they found Natasha's car was still in a nearby parking lot. At that moment, a man was standing near her car. He was nervous and behaved rather strangely. In his conversation with the police, he told them that he and Natasha had a relationship and that he was there because he was trying to figure out where she could have gone. The man's name was Michel Trottier. There were scratches on the back door of Natasha's car. However, it was unclear if this had something to do with her disappearance or if the scratches appeared earlier. There was no reason to suspect Michel Trottier of involvement in Natasha's disappearance, and the detectives continued their work. After interviewing Natasha's colleagues, they discovered she was at work on October 1, 2009. That was the day before the disappearance. None of those who worked with her that day noticed anything strange in her behavior. She was in a good mood and friendly as always. Nothing seemed to bother her. On October 2, Natasha needed a day off as she and her mother planned to resolve issues with a tombstone for her recently deceased father. Therefore, on October 1st, she stayed at work longer than usual and left the building at about 8 p.m. According to her friends, Natasha had no conflicts with anyone and it was difficult to imagine that someone could hold a grudge against her. She worked in an office and had no contact with prisoners. They described her as an open and kind person. The police sent a large number of officers to search for Natasha Cournoyer. The search even involved aviation and canine service. First, they examined the territory adjacent to the parking lot. However, they did not find any clues that could help the investigation. Natasha's friends and relatives tirelessly put up flyers with her photo and hoped someone could see her or know something about her disappearance. The first hours after a person goes missing are the most important. That's when witnesses or some evidence are more likely to be found. In the case of Natasha Kurnuey, valuable time was lost because the police received the report on the evening of October 2nd, 21 hours after she had left her workplace. The search activities took place on the 3rd, 4th, and 5th of October and did not produce any results. Her relatives offered a $10,000 reward for the information that could help pinpoint Natasha's whereabouts. Michelle Trottier, the man dating Natasha, believed that someone kidnapped her. Through television, he turned to a possible kidnapper with a request to release his beloved. The police, meanwhile, studied the personal lives of Michelle and Natasha. They dated for four years, and their relationship was far from ideal. As the detectives managed to find out, Michelle and Natasha broke up several times, but then resumed their relationship again. The police considered all possible versions of the woman's disappearance. Restoring the events of Natasha's last day at work, the detectives accessed CCTV cameras inside the building where she worked and on its facade. She entered the building at 9.04 a.m. Natasha came to work by car, which she left in an open parking lot. There were few free parking spaces that morning, and she parked the car on the opposite side, away from the road. Reviewing the recordings further, they found that Natasha left the building at 8.07 p.m. Another video footage confirmed that she went to the place where she parked her car, but that part of the parking lot had poor lighting. At some point, Natasha disappeared into the darkness. After a few minutes, you could see how the car headlights turned on. The car started moving, not to the exit, but to the opposite side of the parking lot. This place also had poor lighting. When the car stopped, the headlights went out. The vehicle stood at this place for about 20 minutes and then began to move to the exit. 
and it was not Natasha's car since she drove a Mazda. As it was possible to establish from other records, a Ford Windstar minivan got on the video. It also turned out that this car drove into the parking lot at 6.35 p.m. and parked next to Natasha's car. Based on everything seen in the video, the police assumed that Natasha Cornoyer's disappearance was most likely a kidnapping. On the fifth day of the search, October 6, 2009, that wasn't about a missing person anymore, but about the deprivation of a person's life. They found Natasha's body in a vacant lot in the Pointe aux Trumble area, about 20 miles from where she worked. The body lay next to a dirt road that led to the riverbank. The news of Natasha's death shocked all her relatives and friends. They felt even worse when they heard the information from the medical examiner's report. The cause of Natasha's death was strangulation. Before she died, someone hit her nine times in the face and broke her nose. There were marks on her wrists and ankles, which indicated that someone tied her up during her lifetime. They found seminal fluid inside the body. It served as a source of DNA. While waiting for the results of the DNA analysis, the detectives tried to identify the owner of the minivan recorded on the day Natasha disappeared. In 2009, there were two motels near where she worked. Ten days after the body was found, on October 16, 2009, the police visited both of them. Checking the cards that guests fill out upon check-in, the police discovered that a man who indicated his vehicle as a Ford Windstar was staying at the Lido Motel on the day Natasha Cournoyer disappeared. The man turned out to be 48-year-old Claude LaRouche, who was a registered sex offender and served time twice. In 1993, the court sentenced him to one year in prison and two years of probation for forcing a 19-year-old acquaintance to have sexual intercourse. In 2005, the court sentenced LaRouche to 40 months in prison for attempting to kidnap a seven-year-old girl who miraculously managed to break free from his embrace and run into a neighbor's house. Just think about these words. For trying to kidnap a seven-year-old child, they sent him to prison for only 40 months. Please write in the comments below what you think about this punishment. Isn't it too soft? In November 2008, LaRouche was free again. He began working as a carpenter and married a woman with two sons. In 2009, they all lived together in this house, a 10-minute drive from the parking lot from which Natasha Cournoyer disappeared. So, as I said before, the detectives discovered that Claude LaRouche checked into a motel the night Natasha disappeared. They called forensic experts to the room where he was staying. They found badly rubbed dark red stains on the carpet and sent the samples for analysis. On the same day, the detectives went to the address where LaRouche lived to talk to him. Due to the nature of the cases for which he had previously been in prison, his DNA was already in the possession of the police. However, they needed time to compare it with the DNA found on Natasha's body. The man denied knowing who Natasha Cournoyer was, but admitted that he frequented the Lido Motel because it was cheap. According to his story, he was dissatisfied with his intimate life with his wife and often rented a room in a motel where he called women who offered sexual services for money. When asked about where he was and what he was doing on October 1st, the day Natasha disappeared, LaRouche said that he did not remember anything, including that he did not remember staying at the Lido Motel that day. LaRouche attributed this memory lapse to taking too many illegal substances, but very soon, though not in full, the memory returned to him. A month after the body was found on November 5, 2009, the detectives again came to his house, this time not to talk. The DNA analysis established that the seminal fluid in Natasha Cornoyer's body belonged to Claude LaRouche. Natasha's DNA was found in the motel room he rented and in the interior of his car. The victim did not know the suspect, and there was no link between the crime and Cornoyer's work as a communications officer for the Correctional Service of Canada, said Montreal Police. I think that with the arrest of this suspect, the citizens could feel safer on the street said Montreal Police Inspector Daniel Rousseau. LaRouche's neighbors were shocked by the arrest. They described him as friendly and polite. The next day, November 6, 2009, Claude LaRouche became a suspect in the case of Natasha Cournoyer. 
At first, he denied his guilt, but realizing there was enough evidence against him, he admitted that he had taken Natasha's life, but at the same time, he insisted that he did not want to do this and that her death was an accident. The trial took place in 2011. It presented two versions of what happened, the version of the defendant and his lawyers and the one of the prosecutor. Let's take a look at Claude LaRouche's version first. His testimony indicated that that evening he was waiting in the parking lot for a vendor of illegal substances. LaRouche was sitting in his car when he saw a woman appear next to him. It was Natasha. He attacked her, pushed her into the interior of his car, and closed the door. Then he talked to her, and Natasha agreed to go with him to the motel. Memory lapses did not allow Claude LaRouche to remember why he stood on the other side of the parking lot for 20 minutes and what he did. Miraculously, the man remembered only those moments that could not work against him. According to LaRouche, when they were in the motel room, Natasha offered to satisfy him if he would let her go after that. He agreed. After Natasha did what LaRouche asked her to, they quarreled. During this quarrel, LaRouche lost control, attacked her, and eventually strangled her. Then he cleaned the room, moved Natasha's body into his car, drove home, and went to bed. In the morning, when all the substances he had used stopped working, he realized that he had done something irreparable and decided to get rid of the body. He cut up Natasha's documents and bank cards and threw them out the car window while driving the body to where they found it. Once again, I emphasize that it is the version of Claude LaRouche. The more he spoke, the more questions his story raised. According to his words, the day after he got rid of the body, he returned to it and covered it with a blanket because he was worried that Natasha would freeze. Another day passed, and he returned to the body to retrieve the blanket. LaRouche was afraid that no one would find Natasha because of the blanket. If we sum up everything he said, we can conclude that he did not remember something because of his clouded consciousness, and some of his actions were illogical. And most importantly, he did not want to take Natasha's life. That's what LaRouche tried to convince the participants in the trial. The prosecution version had material evidence as a base, but they also had a witness who said he was walking his dog near the parking lot on the same day Natasha Cornoye disappeared. There, he witnessed how Claude LaRouche tried to attack a girl who was jogging. But when LaRouche saw a man with a dog, he quickly left. It was about 7 p.m., and he attacked Natasha Cornoye an hour later. The prosecutor believed that LaRouche had tied Natasha up and driven her to a motel against her will. She never came out of the motel alive. In June 2011, Claude LaRouche was found guilty. The court sentenced him to life imprisonment with the right to parole after 25 years. During the trial, they discovered that two weeks after his attack on Natasha Cournoyer, LaRouche tried strangling another woman, Dominique Martel, who bit his finger and managed to fight off the attack. During the trial in this case, Claude LaRouche was declared a dangerous criminal, which, according to Canadian laws, makes his stay in prison indefinite, and he can hardly hope for an early release. Natasha had a quiet and happy life. She had dreams and goals. This life was stolen from her by a man who had already committed serious crimes. But he was free as air. This man had a criminal past and lived among people. How could a man who tried to kidnap a seven-year-old girl end up in society? Why was no one controlling him? These questions do not leave Natasha's family and friends. After all, if the system worked differently and LaRouche was where he belonged, Natasha would have remained alive. 